good, uh, good evening uh, to, to all, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming for this uh, actually third annual event organized in the same room by the Center for, uh, for Palestine uh, uh, Studies, and of course, with the great uh, honor and privilege of having as our guest this evening, uh, Dr. Sahar Khalife. Uh, let me first uh, say a few words about uh, the Center for Palestine Studies, who is uh, organizing this event. I am uh, uh, the, the chair chairperson, uh, Gilbert Ashkar, introducing myself, professor here at SOAS. I said this is the, the third uh, annual event, we, because the first one actually was the, the launching conference for for the Center for Palestine Studies, which was held here uh, in the, the same week of March, uh, uh, two years ago. And that was uh, followed by our first annual lecture, which was last year, uh, uh, and uh, with uh, 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 the Dean of, uh, of Palestine Studies, uh, Professor Walid Khalidi, as uh, a, spe a speaker. So, we are very pleased tonight to have uh, Sahar Khalifi as our uh, uh, second uh, speaker for this, uh, this series of, uh, of, uh, of annual, annual lectures. Now, as, you, as, as comes uh, clear from, uh, from what I said about uh, the, the first uh, launching conference two years ago, so this has been uh, two full years of existence since we founded this uh, Center for, for Palestine Studies, and uh, I'm pleased to say that the, the, the number of, of staff members of SOAS who are now members of the, the center is over 40, which is uh, certainly a ex very high number, and I'm sure one that is very difficult to match even for institutions in the Arab world, so let alone an uh, institution in a Western country. Uh, not to mention also, of course, the number of uh, associate members and uh, PhD students, associate members of, uh, of, uh, of the center. And uh, we are uh, quite uh, proud of uh, our uh, achievements uh, that far in, uh, in working for Palestine studies here at SOAS in London, in the UK, in the Western world, globally. It's a global mission, actually. Uh, but to start with uh, uh, SOAS, uh, we have uh, been promoting, of course, Palestine studies at SOAS uh, through uh, various means. We have launched from the very first year a PhD uh, seminar for students working on Palestine. There are uh, quite uh, a few here at SOAS. But we have also launched uh, uh, something that was mentioned in the first conference, uh, a master degree in, uh, in Palestine studies uh, with a core course in, in Palestine studies which is uh, offered in, uh, in various departments and for, uh, for uh, various degrees. We have also uh, concluded uh, one year ago uh, an agreement for a book series on Palestine studies which will be the first academic book series on of Palestine studies uh, uh, in English, and uh, the first books will be coming out uh, uh, before the end of this year, in the autumn, very probably. Uh, we expect something like uh, three books uh, to start with, and we, our aim is to carry, carry on uh, the rhythm of, uh, of three to five books uh, per year. And, uh, and of course, we are organizing uh, all sorts uh, of events. Let me mention our uh, next event, aside from the annual lecture, uh, we are planning a conference on Gaza, uh, which will take place on, uh, uh, here at SOAS on the 31st of, uh, of October of, uh, of this year. Uh, that's uh, a summary of, uh, of our activities. And uh, without uh, further delay, I will uh, uh, now, hand it to my colleague and friend, uh, Karman Abulsi, who is a member of uh, the uh, 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 advisory committee of, uh, of uh, our center, uh, uh, <clears throat> to uh, present our speaker for tonight, 
So Karma will introduce uh, uh, Sahar Khalifa, and then we will uh, have uh, her lecture. We'll listen to her lecture, to which we are all looking forward uh, uh, eagerly. Uh, after which, uh, uh, Sahar Khalifi will be available to sign uh, uh, her, uh, I mean, there are a few copies of uh, her novels of what is available in English, or a few of what is available uh, outside, as you, you could have seen. So she will be available to, to sign copies uh, after uh, the lecture. So thank you very much, and now you. yours, uh, Karma. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just going to do a little 10 minute introduction to uh, Sahar's work and what's going to come this evening. I warned her that I was going to take the opportunity to praise her before we have heard her, but we all know her from her many works. So it is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Sahar Khalife, Palestinian novelist, social activist, an incredibly productive person in many arenas. Besides fighting her own battles, raising children, organizing cultural programs, working in multiple professional settings, editing magazines, and establishing community centers, she has written no less than 11 novels. Dr. Khalife was born in Nablus, Palestine, in 1942. She attended Birzeit University, receiving a scholarship to pursue her MA in English literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and went on to receive a PhD in women's studies from the University of Iowa. She returned to Palestine at the height of the first intifada in 1988. Her first work, We Are No Longer Your Slave Girls, was published in 1974 and dramatized by Egyptian television in 1982. This was followed by Wild Thorns, a portrait of Palestinian society in the West Bank and its prototypical characters, changing social dynamics and fate in the aftermath of the 1967 war with the arrival of the Israeli military occupation. This novel, published in 1976, established Sahar's reputation as an author. Subsequently, her words gained in strength, momentum, and brilliance. And she produced a host of works, such as Sunflower, Memoirs of an Unrealistic Woman, Courtyard Door, The Inheritance, and The End of Spring. In 2006, she published The Image, The Icon, and The Covenant, a story of devotion, abandonment, and thwarted return centered on the quest to find home and untenable love. For this work, she received the Naguib Mahfouz Medal for Literature, awarded for the best contemporary novel published in Arabic, a remarkable addition to a long list of prizes and honors. Besides achieving fame right across the Arab world, Sahar's novels have reached broad international audiences and the works are translated into many languages, including English, Spanish, Malay, French, Hebrew, Dutch, German, and Italian. In Europe, she is best known as one of the leading members of the second generation of Arab women writers, discussed and studied alongside Hanan Sheikh, Liana Badr, uh, and of course the late Radwa Ashur, who we sadly lost after a fierce battle with cancer last year. In the Arab world, Sahar is also known to have made a major contributions to the literature of steadfastness, which heralded the intensification of Palestinian literary production in the face of Israeli expansionism. Her reputation in both these regards is more than well deserved. Like other members of the second generation of Arab women novelists, Sahar has tirelessly pursued feminist themes in literature, exploring the pathways of patriarchy and the journeys of those who resist it. Equally, however, Sahar's trajectory is quintessentially a Palestinian one. 
the experience of that section of our people who live in the 1967 military-occupied territories. As much as she is a woman of the world, she is locally grounded in her visions and her attachments. Like the pioneering Palestinian female poet Fadwa Tokan, she is a daughter of Nablus, the city in which she was born seven years before our Nakba. Her intimate connections to Nablus's winding roads and alleys and ancient souks, its people and its history, and the stories that unfold between its two mountains are unmistakable. She is also devoted to Jerusalem, a city in which she attended school and which appears so constantly in her oeuvre. In this way, Sahara's authorial voice bears the unmistakable mark of experience in the occupied Palestinian territories. This voice has a clearly different tone and melody than what is heard from those authors of exile and dispersal who are documenting the story of the Pal Palestinian Shatat and the fate of the refugees, the largest sections of our people, still denied the right of return to their homes and lands. Since their forcible disp dispossession, our people have inhabited many lands and have accumulated a multiplicity of experiences, countered countless geographic spaces, and lived an endless variance of political and social experience. There is not a corner of the earth in which you would be hard pressed to find a Palestinian, except perhaps in the Jewish only colonies of apartheid Israel. This re reality has resulted in stories, many stories whose settings differ and whose spatial groundings vary. Yet no matter how far away these stories are set from Palestine, they remain Palestinian. For Palestinian literature, like our identity, is not based on a combination of national particularisms that gave rise to the people, but rather on the glue that keeps us together. Our identity is based on that will, on our people, its spirit, and that is what makes it cohere and gives it its purpose and expression. Sahar's work fits squarely within this broader Palestinian literary tradition. While her stories, like those of the 1948 Palestinian authors, unfold within Palestine, they often share many themes with the stories of her compatriots set in the surrounding Arab countries and well beyond. More important, and besides the similarities, they are also different, and the difference here is something to be celebrated. For the story of the Palestinian people in its totality, with all its richness, tragedies, and endless journeys can only be told through this accumulation of parallel narratives as well as its intersections. Sahar's work follows closely the vicissitudes of persisting native life under the dominance of settler colonial authority. She is concerned with portraying the contradictions and sorrows that ensue out of this reality. Currently, she is haunted by its defeats, exploring them from the angle of famous political characters from modern Arab history, such as Izzeddin al-Qasim, Abdel Qadir Husseini, and Antoun Saadi. Formerly, her focus was on the contradictions, and she has set some precedents in this regard. For instance, her wild thorns can probably be considered to offer the first treatment of the cleavages that ensue out of the phenomena of Palestinian labor inside the Israeli state. This thematic novelty is not by only means Sahara's only characteristic. The steady continuity of her output has meant that her work is one of the few in modern Palestinian literature that mirrors the very story of the occupation of the West Bank from the moment that it began in 1967 to the present day. The grounded and steady and radiance of her output means that it does not only carry literary value, but also a certain historical one. She has managed to produce a range of diverse stories set against a domineering, singular, 
and horrifically destructive background, that of the Israeli colonial enterprise and military occupation. Along with her clear authorial voice, this is the thread that connects a long unfolding chain of intensely human events. Since the occupation began, she has been writing day by day, hour by hour, capturing events as they developed and as human beings, as the Palestinians reacted to them. For the past five decades, she has observed what she saw around her, absorbed it, and transformed it into words for us. For this great service, we are forever in her debt. So please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, brothers and sisters, before delving into the core of my presentation, in which I explain how we Arabs, we Palestinians, we Arab women are caught between Western oppression and Islamic fundamentalist suppression, Allow me first, this is who I am. I'm a Palestinian, in short. I'm a Palestinian, I'm an Arab, and I am a Muslim, which means that I'm a Muslim, Palestinian, Arab. Of course, this means that according to Western media, and Western stereotype prejudices that I am a dangerous creature who belongs to a dangerous culture that has a fixed nature, unable to be converted, unable to change. According to those prejudices, we Arabs are fixed in one static reality, in one static phase. <coughs> We are reduced to a picture that does not change in time or seen under a different light. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, Daesh, ISIS, and Nusra wrapped up women, filthy backward beggars, corrupt rulers, and rotten oil sheikhs. We are fixed in one reality that does not change in time or seen under a different light. But is there an image, a view, a reality that is fixed in nature, unable to change? Let us remember the findings of the great Impressionist artist Cézanne, who used to study the effect of changing light on the same landscape or view. What he found out is that the same landscape or view under a different light produces a different picture. He also found out that we see the same scene differently through our two different eyes. I mean, the right eye and the left eye do not see the same scene the same way because each eye sees the scene from a different angle. So, if a pair of eyes of the same person see the same scene differently, can we infer then that the same scene cannot but be seen differently 
by two different people? Can we also infer that not only light or different eyes make things look different, also different times, different imaginations, emotions, prejudices, and preconditioned concepts? Let me show you from real examples, from down-to-earth experiences, that things cannot be static, and people can never be fixed in one reality, in one static phase, and that no one can claim to know the truth, the absolute truth. As we all know, a woman in the Arab culture and many other cultures means the weak sex, the other sex, the unequal sex, the sex that does not inherit the legacy or perpetuate the family's name. The sex that can bring children as much as it can bring dreadful shame. Within the family where I was born, I was received with, this, with disappointment that reached sobs and tears. Everybody was waiting for a boy. To their dismay, I was a girl. I was the fifth girl in a row, which meant that I was the fifth disappointment, or what my mother considered her fifth defeat. <laughs> Compared to my uncle's wife, who victoriously brought, produced 10 precious boys, my mother was a loser, an unblessed wife. My mother was more beautiful, more intelligent, and more dignified than my uncle's wife, and all other wives in the family. Nevertheless, everybody looked at her as the least productive, with no valuable fruits. I inherited those prejudices. I inherited those prejudices and concepts. Since childhood, I repeatedly heard them say that we girls of the family, girls of the neighborhood, and girls of the world were powerless, helpless, a sex doomed by nature, the sex that is permanently weak. As far as I remember, I started my fight with nature since I was a child. As a child, they considered me rebellious, over-dynamic, very loud and fussy, and uneasy to cope with. I wanted to prove, I wanted to prove that despite my doomed nature, I was good and worthy, bright and clever, cute and funny. I wanted to prove that despite my, the, uh, that I was important as my adored brother, the only boy among six girls, and that I deserved the same importance and love. Of course, I failed. For years I failed. People continue saying, women are weak, women are worthless, and women are nameless. They do not inherit the legacy or perpetuate their family's names. To my surprise, and I hope to yours too, a few months ago, my younger sister told me that she accidentally discovered that I was the only member within the Khalifa family which is as large as a tribe, whose name was listed in the Palestinian Encyclopedia. With a sigh of relief, she added, not my father, not my brother, not my uncle with his 10 miraculous boys, not any male in the family was mentioned in our encyclopedia. It was only you. I also sighed with relief and told her, my dear sister, you have to notice that many women are now listed in the Egyptian encyclopedia, the Syrian encyclopedia, the Lebanese, the Algerian, the Moroccan, the, the rest of Arab encyclopedias. Things have changed. Things are changing. Things have changed. When I say that things change, I mean that things are not static. Things are moving. Things are apt to change. 
For me, as an Arab woman, I passed different phases. I was trans transformed by currents, and I was a transmitter of change. Even among the most conservative Arab families, women now go to school. When they earn education, they become teachers, doctors, engineers, pharmacists, writers, musicians, artists. Many women now are considered indispensable, stronger than men, more creative than men, and more important than, than men. Things have changed. But mind you, when I see our image in the Western media as dreadful creatures wrapped up in their shadows with masks of leather, harems behind their veils, I ask with amazement, why do they see us fixed in one reality, in one static phase? They draw us a picture that is constantly gloomy, seen through one single light. Is this what they consider a true picture? Do they think that ha God has created us differently than the female sex, unable to change? Now, let me tell you the story of how I was introduced to the concept of change. How I discovered that what people might believe in something as true is not the truth, because things keep changing in essence and in shape. When I was still a child, I had a teacher who constantly mentioned the word change in different tones and meanings. He mentioned the word change when he spoke about, Arab, about social just injustice. He mentioned change when he spoke about fair distribution of Arab wealth. He mentioned change when he spoke about Arab women's status, and he mentioned change when he spoke about Arab out-of-date regimes. Everybody I knew, everybody I knew respected and admired that teacher. The young ones wanted to be like him. The old ones were keen to hide him when he was chased by the police. When I became a teenager, I discovered that my great teacher was not the only one who spoke about change and justice. Most of our educated people believed in and spoke for those beliefs and thoughts. I also discovered that thousands of our enlightened men, similar to my teacher, were either chased by the police or rotting in jails of regimes supported, backed, and nourished by Western powers, British, French, and later on American. Excuse me. Talking about change, we Arabs still remember that the one who encouraged that mood was our great nationalist leader, Jamal Abdel Nasser. Apart from his fiery and moving speeches in which he spoke about equality, fraternity, and justice, he inspired the masses and filled them with self-esteem when he inflicted an enormous blow on the two greatest colonial powers of that time, Great Britain and France, with the nationalization of the Suez Canal. The rage of the two states reached the climax in 1956, when together with their ally, Israel, conducted a military campaign against Nasser in order to overthrow him. However, that assault failed, and Nasser emerged both stronger and more influential. Nasser's policy, or hope, or dream, of reuniting the Arab world, reviving what existed before Sykes-Picot agreement that divided the Middle East in, after World War I into small, easily dominated states, as still the case now, all that 
invoked Western fear and anxiety about the establishment of a strong, totally independent, single Arab state capable of putting an end to Western exploitation and manipulation and of threatening its ally Israel. That is why the Western media plotted against Nasser, depicting him as a new Arab Hitler, accusing him of fascism and many, many other prov provocative and terrible names and descriptions. Nevertheless, the 50s and 60s were the golden Arab era of nationalism, of Arab nationalism. The Arab street was full of vigor and hope for transformation. Our attitudes toward our traditional socio-political systems was rebellious and sharply critical. We reflected our themes of liberation and social justice in our literature, our theater, our songs, music, and the idioms we used in our daily life. Literature from all over the world was pouring into our culture. In our bookshops and on street pavements, you could find existentialist literature, socialist literature, black literature, and every literature that called for liberation, revolution, and change. That mood for liberation and change influenced everybody, including the illiterate peasants. Women, too, were affected were touched. They started to go out in the streets without their veils. Tens of thousands of young women graduated from universities. Some of them started to get involved in politics and enrolled in political parties. Women not only took their veils off, they also wore the sleeveless and mini skirts. I did that. My generation did that. You might not believe it. We were dancing rock and roll and twist despite our hatred to the West. <laughs> we wanted to be like the West. We wanted to be like the West, but not under its domination and control. That entire dreamlike atmosphere came to a halt when Israel, backed by the West, defeated Nasser in 1967. That defeat represented the defeat of our national movement and our socialist beliefs. The Americans and their allies in the region took that opportunity. They forcefully supported the move away from our leftist liberal nationalism by backing the Islamists. They poured millions of dollars in that direction. The Muslim Brothers Party which was completely ignored by the masses, start to gain, started to gain power. What happened in our region in the 70s and 80s was very much similar to what happened in Afghanistan when the Americans supported the Islamists, including bin Laden, to bring <laughs> down the communists. A similar scenario, almost the same, took place in our region. Surprisingly, to America's dismay, the Islamists turned their back against their supporters once they took hold of the street. They became a crystallized power. They no longer needed America. After being pampered and nourished and being called Mujahideen, which means freedom fighters in Arabic, America started calling them terrorists. And Europe followed the American style. That was the time when we started witnessing the birth of a new era, which we iron, ironically define as change. But what kind of change? In Palestine, the Israelis copied the American model. They encouraged the Islamists to stand in the face of the nationalist socialist PLO. While they were chasing, harassing, and assassinating PLO leftists and liberal leaders and activists, they pretended not to see what the Islamists were doing to women and to society at large. They infiltrated hundreds of them, and later on thousands, men and women, in our educational system. 
Thus, the Islamists gained more power through influencing students at an early age. Once the Islamists were sure of their grip, they turned their forces against the West and Israel. They became a crystallized power. What helped them reach that stage was not just the nationalist socialist defeat deepened by the downfall of the Soviet bloc, nor was it the early American Israeli support. The maladministration and inadequacy of many corrupt leaders on our side added to their success. <coughs> Arab women. Now let's focus on Arab women. Let's focus on Arab women's situation and the double oppression they receive and they suffer from both East and West. Arab women, as I mentioned earlier, are presented in the Western media, newspapers, magazines, journals, TV reports, movies, academic studies, and people prejudiced behavior in the street Arab women are presented and symbolized as wrapped up creatures from head to toe, unable to, to breathe or think under black shadows and thick veils, with just, with just eyes visible, sometimes not visible, move like shadows, float in vacuums like witches or dreadful ghosts. The dress of the wrapped up woman who represents me and women like me is called the hijab. I'm sure you heard, you heard about it. The hijab or the Islamic dress, which I definitely believe is not Islamic or Arab. I even dare say it is a trend or a fashion manipulated by the West to keep half the Arab society fragmented dormant and stupid. The present hijab, or the so-called dress, the so-called Islamic dress, as far as I know, is a Western creation and an awkward manifestation of the influence of Western imperialist civilization. Oof. This sounds ridiculous, isn't it? Who can believe this? The hijab is a Western creation. One or many of you might argue, but the hijab has always been a part of the Arab culture. You, Sahar Khalifa, how dare you deny that? Your mother wore the hijab. Your grandmother wore the hijab. Your grand, great-grandmother, Virgin Mary, wore the, head, the, the hijab. So how can you deny? Ah, you know that Virgin Mary was a Palestinian. Don't you know that? She wore the hijab, the, the head cover, or some, something similar to the hijab. She, she wore a head cover and abaya, chador, that covered her sacred body from head to toe. Since 2,000 years or more, the hijab has always been a part of our culture. This is what people say. So how dare you, Sahar Khalifa, say it is a Western creation and an awkward manifestation of the influence of Western imperialist civilization? This is absurd, utterly foolish. You must be out of your mind. Okay, to be honest, I do confess that as far as I remember, my mother wore the hijab, but not this kind of hijab. I mean what is now being called the Islamic dress. What my mother used to wear, which also was a, a manifestation of the influence of the Turkish rule and the Ottoman culture, my mother used to wear a piece of transparent material, black in color, maybe some of you remember that type of dress, loosely covering her, her, face, her face and head. It lay so loosely on her head that allowed her see and breathe. Apart from that, her clothing consisted of a modest skirt or dress reaching to her knees and a short jacket emphasizing her chest and waistline, thus greatly con 
contrasting what today is considered Islamic dress, a dress which makes a woman's body look like a long shapeless sack, a dark log, a column of smoke. In the early 50s, my mother and most women of her generation took their veils off in a move that was called sufur. The move was called sufur, which meant to show, to reveal, to uncover. She stopped wearing the jacket and wore either a costume or a short sleeve dress and followed the fashion of the day whether in her short hairstyle or in the color and cut of her clothes. She behaved just like other middle-class women in most Arab cities, but also like the less fortunate in most smaller towns. Those of you who had the opportunity to attend concerts or watch all videos of the great Arab singer Um Kalsoum and other singers of that period realized that not a single woman among the audience wore what is now being called the Islamic dress. At that time, I mean during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, Arab women across classes, all classes, in most Arab cities and towns, wore what I'm wearing now, and most women here in this hall. No abaya, no chadors, no veil, no veil, no burqa. It was only village peasants who continued to wear traditional clothing similar to what Virgin Mary had worn 2,000 years ago. My mother got rid of her veil immediately after Israel occupied most of Palestine in 1948. That occupation brought about a political and economic catastrophe accompanied by social upheavals that did away with many values and long established traditions, including the veil and restrictions on women's freedom of movement on the street, in school, and in work, at work. That catastrophe directly affected women since the declining economic situation resulted in thousands of families that had lost their homeland, their properties, their houses, their land, and many of their, uh, their men in war, thousands of families were forced to take women out of the domestic sphere and send them out to work or allow them to study. Obtaining education allowed them to work in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. That time, there was no Gulf, no, no Dubai, no Sharqa, no, uh, no Abu Dhabi. It was only Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, thereby feeding their families or paying for their brothers and sisters to study to become doctors, engineers, lawyers, and the like. We started to witness thousands of educated Palestinian girls traveling abroad without their head covers, living there on their own, modestly and unmarried, but highly esteemed by their families and society, because they became breadwinners for families with, their, with, with low incomes. As I describe the situation of such women in my novel, translated and published by uh, the American University in Cairo. As time passed, it was not just accepted, but even welcomed that those young women financed their younger sisters' studies at Arab universities in Egypt, Syria, and Lebanon, enabling them to bring back diplomas in medicine, pharmacy, engineering, law, and other subjects, as I mentioned earlier. Those young women being trained and pursuing re recognized jobs were educated, courageous, and open to the world, and they launched a wave of feminist and social emancipation even though our knowledge of the feminist movement and feminist thinking was limited to what a number of pioneers, such as Amina Saeed, Soher al-Qalamawi, and Durriya Shafiq, had written in Egyptian newspapers and magazines with articles that did not go beyond such relatively 
lightweight themes as family planning, marriage, early marriages, polygamy, and such like. As I mentioned earlier, right after our defeat by Israel in 1967, dictatorial, anti-socialist, anti-liberal Arab regimes, you might guess whom I'm talking about, backed by America, allied, allied themselves with fundamentalist groupings, making millions available for supporting and strengthening that, this movement. For instance, and I saw it with my own eyes. All those who wore the so-called Islamic dress received a monthly payment, 15 dinars for a man, 10 for a woman. For a man, this clothing consists of a short dish dashe, or gallabiya, which is almost a long dress for a man. And also, he wore leather sandals together with a long, untrimmed beard. You know how much it, uh, it means for, for poor people occupied, hungry, with no incomes, to have such an amount. Uh, one, a dinar is almost equivalent to one pound, sterling pound. And at that time, in the 70s, it was a big amount for them, for, for poor people. For a woman, a thick, a thick head cover and a long dark colored coat reaching to her toes. Recipients were also given free of charge, prayer beads, rosaries, plus a splendid edition of the Quran and a beautiful prayer mat. To begin with, these Islamic organizations concentrated on young people who had demonstrated the capacity for leadership and were in a position to extend, to exert influence on others. They also wanted to reach women at home. Meetings were arranged and cells formed in the houses of women from the lower middle class. Then attention turned to mosques, schools, and universities. All that happened thanks to financial and other assistance from other regimes loyal to the U.S., directed by the U.S., following and applying plans of the U.S. in the hope that this Islamic input would keep our Arab society from uh, free of socialist ideas and progressive projects. Progressive projects that called for emancipation on all spheres, beginning with liberation from Western influence and extending to the unleashing of creative energies in our society. However, the support for fundamentalist Islamists wasn't limited to the provision of free clothing, monthly payments, and meeting places. Fertile ground was also prepared in primary and secondary schools. Islamists, both male and female, were given preference in the appointment of teachers, charged with influencing young pupils and students so that fundamentalist thinking and ideology became part of the children's psyche and intellect. In addition, Youngsters received training in military discipline and martial arts at special camps established in Arab deserts and in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Absurdly though, the US and its allies only became aware of how dangerous this turn or trap was after the magic had been deployed against the magician and fundamentalist organizations began threatening to establish a strict fundamentalist regime such as the woman, uh, as the one we are witnessing now, Daesh. At present, we, ex we exist amid alarming intellectual, social, and political chaos. Things are out of joint and we are now threatened from two sides without knowing which is more brutal. 
On one side is the West, whose plotting, exploitation, and colonization are familiar to us. And on the other, the fundamentalist Islamist movement, which has blessed us with innovations, throwing us back into an age of oppression and of the harem. Here, the free, liberal, secular, scientific, but also colonial West, and there the inflexibility of an Islam that calls for resistance to the West and its concerns, but is blind to the sciences, to modernity, and to feminist and social emancipation. This intellectual, social, and political chaos hasn't only affected us, it has also spread to the West, so that our women with shadows and veiled faces have become a phenomenon here that arouses fear and abhorrence. In some Western states, Islamic clothing is forbidden by law, and women wearing such clothing are no longer allowed to enter schools, universities, and public offices. Beyond that, people in the West now believe that all Arabs and all Muslims are equally strict, fanatical, and intellectually closed, just like fundamentalist Islamists, thereby forgetting or denying that this movement was originally a child of the West and its reactionary allies, threatening our democratic, secular, and scholarly attitudes, and also the fate of us women. Now the West persecutes us with new and highly racist prejudices, arbitrarily and sweepingly lumping together all Arabs, Muslim and Christian, reproaching us with something for which it should really blame itself. I feel frustrated when I write or speak to Western audience because I know that most of the population is indifferent and feel no sympathy for us. When I walk through Western streets, I can almost hear how people naively and egoistically ask themselves, why should we do anything for the Arabs when they don't look after themselves? Why should we be concerned about Arab women who are so remote from us and so different in their religion, color, and nationality? <coughs> Whatever may, may happen to them cannot happen to us or threaten us. For my part, I say to people who think in this narrow-minded and egoistic way that we are closer to you than you believe or imagine. Haven't we time and again said that the world has become a little global village? Now we are coming to you as human waves, breaking through your beaches. Whatever you do to restrict immigration and intensify surveillance, we shall find ways of getting to you, surmounting your barriers, and asserting your, our presence among you. We are here among you. You cannot deny our presence because we are behind you, in front of you, and have become part of your system. One day, we shall become an effective electoral force and bring a change similar to ours, one that makes you share our fragmentation and fear. I in no way intend to anger people in the West. All I want is to defend my case palpably and graphically. I want to make a Western audience feel what I feel, fear what I fear, and make them painfully aware of what their colonial governments, governments do to us, do to me. I see how the Western media force me into a stereotype, judging and falsifying me when they present a woman in a burqa as exemplifying Arab womanhood, Muslim and Christian, they silently declare that I, the feminist writer, and thousands of educated women like me, and millions of modern Arab women, Muslim and Christian, in all Arab countries, are like that woman with a burqa, a somber face, a head weighed down, brainless, speechless, shapeless, and utterly stupid. And that is not true. Since the image of a woman in a burqa 
fills women like me with fear and horror. We fear that one day a hand will extend out of that image, out of that picture of the woman with the burqa, drawing my daughters, my granddaughters, and myself into a sinister Arab regime kept in the dark by Western plans, so Western plans and policies so that we remain what we were and what we are, what we still are, an Arab oil field on the Western market. As you can see, I told you my story as a woman, as a Palestinian, and as an Arab. An Arab. I told you those story, stories from my perspective, from my experiences, and from my beliefs, which I consider real and true. But for you here in the West, from what you have learned or came to believe, you might have different thoughts or visions about all what I just said, right? This is normal and understandable. You know why? Because we too, as Arabs, as Palestinians, and as Arab women, have different beliefs and visions about your culture, about your history, and about your behavior. But what you see and what we see, is it true and real? Is it the truth? We have to raise these questions unless we are satisfied with our prejudices and fixed in our traditional beliefs. Where did I reach with my rambling thoughts and scattered images? That we are all victims of prejudiced cultures? This is really absurd. It is unfair and depressing. For we human beings, despite our differences, our fences, our limited spheres and visions, we all share one truth that is absolutely true and worthy, that is bright and hopeful, that is worth living for and dying for. It is the truth that is based on love and liberty. Love for all and liberty for all. And again, despite our differences of race, religion, sex, and politics. We all need love. We all need warmth. We all need intimacy. We all need to be recognized as humans, sensitive humans, tender humans, and capable humans. We all need to communicate our thoughts and feelings. We all need to hold and embrace. Is there a truth beyond this truth, more real, more genuine, and more precious and worthy. And liberty, is there a conscious human being who does not seek liberty or spends a whole life searching for liberty? We call it liberty that leads for freedom, for freedom of the body, freedom of the soul, freedom of the heart, freedom of the mind, and freedom of speech. So there is a truth I believe in, despite my suspicious mind. Deep in my heart, I believe that people deserve love, love and liberty that makes them whole, fill them with joy, fill them with light, fill them with dignity. Did you believe me when I started my talk saying that there is no reality that is permanently fixed or true? Did you believe me? Well, that wasn't true. It was a trick, a game or what we call in literature, a technique. All what I meant is to draw your attention, to shake some prejudices, to shed some light. That's why I reminded you of Cezanne's findings about the effect of changing light on vision and sight. I hope you forgive me. I hope you recognize me. I hope you love me, despite our differences of color and light, vision and sight. Thank you. <laughs>